Hello there! Welcome to Scanning Cube Productions. I'm Crown Rose Cocon. Let's get into the video. Today's video, we're going to be uh, continuing with our History of Israel series. And this is part two of that series. And we're going to be focused on the Mandate of Palestine from 1917 to 1948. So, uh, first of all, we want to give a massive shout out to uh, Jake Sussman, uh, who obviously uh, suggested uh, uh, that I do this series, as well as uh, the fact that in this video, he's going to be uh, providing uh, some of the images for this. So, uh, yeah, big shout out to him. And uh, also, don't forget, obviously, hit the like button, subscribe if you haven't already, hit the bell button so you stay notified, and check out our many other videos on this topic and many others. And also, don't forget to uh, leave a comment in this, yeah, for your thoughts on the thing and uh, yeah so yeah that would be really helpful and really help this series to really pop off because so far we've had really really good reviews from it uh, and I'd like to hear people debating some of the, the things in the comment section as long as it's respectful as long as it's respectful right but still we kind of covered that now we've got all that business out of the way so now we can kind of focus on the history of this uh, era so where our story finished off last time was with General Allenby marching through the gates of Jerusalem, and this represented the first time in almost 700 years that a non-Muslim had control of the city. So, obviously the British and the French have kicked out the Ottoman Turks, and they set up occupied enemy territory administrations, right? So the acronym for this is the OETA, which is quite clumsy of an acronym, but still. So this, it was split up into different uh, sections, so you had OETA South, you had uh, East, you had West, and I believe also you had North as well. Now what we're going to mainly focus on here is the OETA South, and this is what comprises most of uh, the state of uh, Israel slash Palestine today, although the northern part of what's today Israel was uh, taken up uh, by uh, OETA West. So within OTA South, uh, you had just 10% of the population there being comprised of Jews, and you also had a number of Jews, although much less, in uh, East and West OETA. However, this would all change, and you had in 1920 the setting up of the Mandate Palestine. So this now would comprise what we today think of as Israel slash Palestine. And during this time, you already had the setting up of you know, the later conflict which would arise between the Arabs and the Jews. And this is because, unlike in other places, right, where you might have the setting up of uh, a combined legislature, a combined kind of uh, organisation where people from uh, the territory would come together, in this case here, you can already start to see parallel and completely separate organisations and legislatures being set up. So the Arab nationalists in 1919, they had set up the Palestine Arab Congress, and a year later, the Jews have set up the Assembly of Representatives. So here, you can really start to see that the two sides are completely opposite, completely separate, completely parallel. So there's now no dialogue, really, between the different groups. Both sides are looking out for their own interests, and both sides have no interest in looking out for the interests of the others. And this was a time when there was going to be a lot of changes. Because before, the Jews uh, of this region had lived under the old Yeshuv. And these were the Jews who had lived there throughout all this time, throughout you know, the, the previous like 2,000 years or so, right? And they had always been there. However, you started to have the new Yeshuv. And this was comprised primarily of Jews who were coming from the uh, diaspora. And these were primarily those who were coming from Europe. And this was the beginning of the Aliyah. So the Aliyah, in Hebrew, it means the ascent, and this is in reference originally to the ascent to Jerusalem, because Jerusalem's on a hill. However, the term Aliyah, in uh, the sense that we're using it here, refers to the mass migration of the Jewish diaspora back to the land of Israel. So during this time, this is when it was really beginning to ramp up, and you can really start to see the mass opposition of this by the Arabs towards these Jewish migrants. So as early as uh, March 1920, you had the Battle of Tel He, right? I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. And this marks the very first shot in the Arab-Israeli uh, conflict, which was to come. And a month afterwards, yeah, you had uh, a series of riots which took place in Jerusalem. So as early as 1920, you can really start to see the Arabs revolting and rioting against the Jewish uh, population, both that are already there and the Jews which are coming in. And also as well, what was notable with this is that the British were very slow to react. 
which meant that now both the Jews and the Arabs began to distrust them and become very hostile. So it ended up being this pattern of this. The Arabs revolt against the Jews. The British are slow to defend the Jews. The Jews set up paramilitary organizations to defend themselves. And now they distrust the British and they also uh, distrust the Arabs. So this cycle would basically be the pattern of uh, escalation, which we'd see now throughout the next 28 years of the mandate's existence. So now we're going to start talking about the mass migration of Jews to this region. And you're going to get an idea of just how drastic and how dramatic this was. So in 1922, just 11 percent of the population of Palestine were comprised of Jews and they numbered 84,000. By 1931, they comprised 17% of the population and you had 175,000 of them. By 1945, they now made up 31% of the population of the region and you had 553,000 of them. So there was an average annual growth rate of 8.6% with regard to the Jews compared to just 2.6% for the Arabs. And this was mainly due to mass migration. So most of these Jews uh, were fleeing from Europe in particular Poland, of which 46% of them end up coming from. So from 1922 to 1936, whilst Muslims increased by just 64%, the Jews end up increasing their number by 558%, with almost 284,000 arriving as immigrants during this time. By 1945, you had 367,000 845 Jews who had migrated and these represented 91.7% of all immigrants who came to the region between 1920 and 1945 and 74% of all Jewish population growth is attributable directly to immigration so it's not as if the Jews are having a lot more children they are increasing their numbers only because of mass migration now, these figures here would have alarmed even Enoch Powell, so like we discussed in our video uh, to do the Six Day War, you know, Enoch Powell was speaking about a tiny percentage of people coming uh, to uh, Britain at that time as immigrants. In this case here, it was much, much larger. And whereas he had spoken about rivers of blood and this never came to pass in Britain, in this case here, there really were rivers of blood. Now, most of the Jews here, they weren't just the Zionists, right? So obviously some of them came for ideological reasons, right? They want to set up a, a Jewish homeland in the state of Israel. But many of them were just humble refugees who were fleeing from persecution in Europe. So in particular, in Poland and in Hungary, you had anti-Semitic uh, governments in the 1920s and 1930s who were persecuting Jews and were levying very, very high taxes on them. But in 1933, you started to have a bit of a change of this, right? Because it wasn't just from these places in Eastern Europe. You also started to have German Jews wanting to leave for very obvious reasons. And all of this was really starting to annoy the Arabs, right? So they had opposed the third Ilya, the fourth Ilya, and now the fifth Ilya, right? And this is where you end up having the Great Arab Revolt, otherwise known by them as the Great Palestinian Revolt. So from 1936 to 1939, this is a huge uprising yeah, of the Arabs against the British authorities and the new Jewish immigrants, right? And also the settlers who were already there. So obviously this ended up leading to a whole lot of uh, strife and turmoil and stuff. And 5,000 Arabs were killed as the British crushed this revolt. But in this time, you'd already had the setting up of the Haganah in 1920. And uh, you had the setting up of the Ergan in uh, 1931. So these are paramilitary Jewish organizations which were set up for the defense of the Jews. And they cooperated with the British in crushing uh, this revolt and also defending the Jewish uh, communities there. So now you start to have a situation whereby, you know, the, the Arabs can't trust uh, the British because they believe that the Jews are now supporting them. And you know, the Jews are kind of like not really trusting the British because they're being too slow in the defense of them against the Arabs. So as a result of this uh, revolt, you end up having the Jews really start to uh, uh, focus in on their own settlements and their own defences. And this is where you start to have tower and stockade defences, right? So this is where the Jewish defence is there. They basically have their own like uh, a system of defending their perimeters. And then also as well, the British to try and subdue the, the Arabs, right? They say, OK, right, fine. We're going to put a halt on Jewish migration. So in 1935 alone, you had 61,854 new Jewish immigrants. By 1939, 
this figure had fallen to just 16,405 new Jewish immigrants that year. So, you know, they're trying to now like put a damp on things. They're saying, okay, right, the Arabs are annoyed because of this mass Jewish migration. So now what we're going to do is we're going to try and put a lid on it. So the Jews obviously still continued, right, uh, to migrate there. And this was the so-called illegal Aliyah, and this was called Aliyah Bet. So for those who know Hebrew, they'll know that Bet is a B in uh, the Hebrew alphabet. So this is Aliyah B. So during this time, you had 45,000 illegal Jewish migrants still coming in to the region. So the British had tried to cap uh, the number of Jews who were coming there to 75,000 over the period of the next five years. And they said uh, in, in 1937 with the Peel Commission that there was going to be a partition plan. So the Jews, who were mainly centred in this tiny little region, mainly in like, the north of the country, they eventually were going to just be partitioned away and they would have their own separate state. However, in 1939, they changed their mind. And so this is where you have the white paper. So this basically established that within the next 10 years, so by 1949 at the latest, there was going to be an independent Palestine and you were going to have a Jewish homeland within this uh, independent thing. So it's kind of rather than there being a two state solution, this is essentially the first uh, uh, inkling of a one state solution, right? Where the Jews can have their own homeland, but there still would be an independent Palestine and the British would withdraw. And also as well within uh, this white paper, it restricted the Jews to owning just 5% of the land. So by 1944, this figure kind of creeped up a little bit to 6% uh, of the land. But where the Jews owned land was very kind of disproportionate, A, to their population and B, across that, the kind of country, right? So whereas in Jerusalem, for instance, where they made up 40% of the population, there they owned just 2% of the land. Whereas in Jaffa, where they had uh, set up uh, Tel Aviv, they made up 72% of the population, but they owned uh, just 39% of the land. So as you can see, even though it's like 5 to 6% of the land that they own in terms of like the total area, Actually, when you break it down, they only have a big ownership in a handful of different places. Now, with this, you can already start to see the beginning of the Arab habit of not realizing reality, right? And coming to terms with reality. Now, what I mean by that is they're outnumbered, they're outgunned, they're not in a position to be able to equally negotiate. And yet still, even though this white paper restricted immigration, even though it said that there would eventually be an independent Palestine, even though it did all these kind of things as this kind of like a compromise between the two, it still was a thing where the Arabs said, no, no, no. And the British obviously did this, yeah, because they had bigger things to worry about, right? Uh, especially what was going on in Europe at the time. And they obviously just wanted peace within uh, their uh, colonies. So that's why they kind of did this. But still, during World War II, the Arabs actually allied themselves with Hitler, right? So with the Mufti of Jerusalem, he aligned himself with Hitler and both of them agreed on many uh, anti-Semitic uh, tropes or rather I should say anti-Jewish because the Arabs technically are Semites as well. But still, that was something which, which uh, many Jews uh, still remembered and that's something which even today is still remembered as a thing of, you know, the Arabs can't really be negotiated with because they even side with Hitler to destroy the Jews. Now, during World War II, it's a thing where 30,000 Palestinian Jews enlisted for the British army and you had 12,000 Palestinian Arabs who also did the same thing. And worldwide, you had 1.5 million Jews from all the different services of the different allied armies, right, serving in that war. And so after the war and after you'd seen uh, all the devastation of the Holocaust, now these people becoming very, very impatient with the British and they were like, we need a Jewish homeland to make sure that this never happens again. So now this is where you start to see Jewish terrorism against the British authorities. So between 1945 and 1947, you end up having a series of terrorist attacks, most notably the King David Hotel bombings, right, in 1946, which killed 91 people. So during this reign of terror, you end up having a total of 141 Brits who end up being killed, as well as 40 Jews who end up dying as well. So now the British, after all these years of uh, admission of the province, right, they basically were now sick of it, right? The Klamatli government, the Labour government, which took over after the war, they just wanted to withdraw from India, they wanted to withdraw from Palestine, and basically what they did is they just said, right, the UN, you guys are now set up, you guys deal with this problem instead. 
and this is where the British withdrew. So the UN, they came together and they came up with a partition plan, which was a very uneven uh, uh, partition plan, especially based on where the populations were at the time, because basically what it did is it split the land 50-50, and actually, you know, the Jews only made up, as we can see, 31% of the population, and most of them were very much centred in a particular region. So it gave them far more land than they actually had control over, and which they actually were majority in, and this is perhaps why even Britain end up abstaining from this decision. However, as we can see on the map here, the Arab nations were really opposed to this. And so as Israel was declaring its independence, these Arab armies were looming and they decided that they were going to strangle the baby in its cradle and snuff out the last little hope of there being the creation of the state of Israel. So that's where we have to leave this video for now. Uh, obviously, we'll cover this more in greater depth uh, in the next video. But yeah, so if you like this video, don't forget obviously hit the like button, subscribe if you haven't already, and hit the bell button so you stay notified for when these uh, uh, other videos come out. And also as well, don't forget to check out our videos on this topic and many other topics as well. You won't be disappointed. And also, like we said, leave a comment in in, in the comment section uh, so that we know your thoughts on this uh, so you know where like we what we've missed out etc and um and just give your opinion on the conflict yeah like which side is more to blame which side is you know like less to blame etc uh, as long as things are respectful i've got no problem with that at all but yeah so that kind of covers the history of the mandate of palestine and yeah with that being said have a great day and bye